With the USMT most recent victory over Costa Rica on October 13th, they are now sitting in second place behind Mexico with 11 points. All things considered, 11 points through six matches isn't exactly where US fans wanted to see this group, given their abysmal loss to Panama on the road. But let's face it, they aren't in a bad position to qualify. And overall, I'm pleased. So here's what we learned. What's up guys, my name is Brian McDonough and welcome to this episode of State of Soccer. Before we kick things off, do me a favor. First things first, smash that like button. Hit like on this video and second subscribe. Subscribe to the channel for weekly content surrounding the beautiful game here in the United States and abroad. So with that, let's get started. The US has a lot of work to do in preparation before their November 12th matchup versus Mexico. But before then, let's take some time to reflect. Here are the five lessons we learned from the US 17's October World Cup qualifying matches in no particular order. Number five, Tyler Adams, Weston McKenney, Eunice Musa in midfield, it works. You could always argue that the inclusion of Gio Reina will call for starting him at the number eight position, but with Reina not being an option, plus Burhalter seems to refuse to play Reina at center attacking mid, Greg before these qualifiers was dealt with formulating a new midfield trio, the trio of Tyler Adams at the number six and Weston McKenney, Eunice Musa as dual number eights, works. This was apparent in both of the US wins versus Jamaica and Costa Rica. In fact, in their loss versus panel, neither Weston McKenney nor Tyler Adams started, and moving forward, this can't happen. If there is an additional lesson within this lesson, it is that Tyler Adams could be our most valuable player. He's our surefire number six and needs to play every World Cup qualifying match if we want a real chance to earn three points. Number four, you always go for three points. When the U.S. kicked off against Panama on October 10th, it was evident that Greg Berhalter was only concerned about getting a point on the road. There are two sides to this argument. I understand the part of being a manager and controlling workload, especially when there are three matches in a week. But these are World Cup qualifiers. You always go for three points, especially in CONCACAF, when you never know what will happen. World Cup qualifiers are completely a different animal. In a way, match in Panama, Costa Rica, or wherever doesn't equate to a Gold Cup match on U.S. soil. So listen up, Burhalter, U.S. Soccer Federation, or whoever is pulling the strings, do better, play our best players. I'll leave it at that. At number three, Brendan Aronson is the real deal. Brendan Aronson can play. No one will doubt that the former Philadelphia Union man is a great player. But what we've learned is that he's incredibly consistent. Whether Brendan is suiting up for Red Bull Salzburg in the Champions League or with the USMNT, he will bring us his all every single match. Aronson makes life difficult for any defender, and he might not be the most skilled player technically, but his positioning, work ethic, and attitude always keeps the US in the game, whether he is out on the wing or in the midfield. I'm really interested to see how Greg Berhalter includes Aronson with the return of Rania and Pulisic. One thing is for certain, at the very least, he is a viable super sub, a player that can impact a match at any time. And likewise, he's also capable of being in the true best 11 for the US. Either way, keep up the incredible work, Brendan. At number two, this team has the right attitude. This young team has the right attitude towards winning. It's apparent that this group of players are very unselfish and committed to the betterment of the team. Now, of course, I'm not in the locker room or in training, but the way this squad bounced back from a 1-0 scoreline against Costa Rica shows that they have a true winning spirit. For this, you of course give the players all of the credit, but also Greg Berhalter. Yes, that's right. Greg has done a great job keeping players, this group of players, together, hungry, and grounded. No one can really dispute that. This might be our golden generation, but that could of course be uprooted at any time with a selfish player. And of course, there was a situation with Weston McKenney, but I was really impressed with how Burhalter, this team, and McKenney handled the situation and put it in the rearview mirror. It is so important that the squad's camaraderie continues to flourish, and without that, really no team has a chance to compete. And finally, number one, here's the preferred starting US 11. We of course know that Pulisic, Rania were missing for these three matches. But even without their inclusion, I think we have finally nailed down the true starting 11 for the USMNT. And here it is. One might ask, where is Yunus Musa? Well, following his performance against Jamaica and Costa Rica, that's a really good question. 
I just personally feel that Aronson is more valuable to have on the field at this point in time. Everyone wants to see Reina in more of a center attacking mid position. Well, at least most USMNT fans would like to see that. So there, there he is. And if not Reina at the number eight, then it will be Musa and Reina as the right wing. And if at any time we fall back on the Adams, McKinney, Musa midfield, we know that can work too. As for the back four, the inclusion of Dest and Robinson is solidified. I still think that John Brooks and Miles Robinson is the best duo at center back. Chris Richards and Walker Zimmerman are both solid backups, but these two should remain on the bench for now due to the Brooks-Robinson partnership that I believe will flourish in time. So what do you think of the starting 11 for the United States men's national team? Or any of my five lessons from these World Cup qualifiers? Let me know in the comments below. So until next time, support your local club and go USMNT.